Hi, this is Maggie. In this video, we're going to go through some basic operations using math and variables in R to build a foundational understanding of R's data types and operations. Eventually, we want to build up to analyzing a data set. So let's take a quick look at a motivating data set that we can use throughout some of these videos. This is ourworldindata.org, and they have a collection of wonderful data sets that you can download and analyze. I thought artificial intelligence might be of particular interest, and I'm interested in what technologies private companies are investing in. So let's use this data, Annual Global Private Investment in Artificial Intelligence by Focus Area. I'll include a link in the description. Here's the chart, but I'm going to click Download and grab the CSV, or Comma Separated Values file, and load that into our studio. So if you haven't already, you should download and install R and then R Studio for your operating system. I'll include some links in the description. And I recommend you open up R Studio and work along with me. For now, I'm going to import this data and take a look at it. We'll talk more about importing data in another video. We're just loading it in so we can talk about data types and operations. So I'll import from text reader and choose it. And our studio loads it in and shows it to me in a tab on the left. So we have our data organized into a table and the columns are entity, code, year, total private investment by focus, area inflation, adjusted. Each column is going to have a data type associated with it. If you've programmed before, you're familiar with data types. If you haven't, a data type is the category of the data and the category determines how the data is represented or stored in the computer, and also what you can do with it. There is text data, which in R we call character data, and there is quantity data here. The quantity data can be floating point, called numeric in R, or integer, and there is also a complex data type. We'll focus here on the numeric data. Suppose we're interested in calculating the difference in spending between two years, such as 2021 and 2017. First, we're going to focus on basics. So I'm going to assign values to two variables down in the console. AgTech 2017 and AgTech 2021. And I do that by writing AgTech underscore 2017, left angle bracket, dash, 413050561 and pressing enter and agtech underscore 2021 left angle bracket dash 142877208 and pressing enter and notice we can now see the variables up in the environment tab variables are named values where the values can change only if you assign them new values, though, or invoke a function that assigns them new values. And the assignment operator, what we use to assign values, is the left angle bracket and the dash, which looks like an arrow. It's showing the direction that the value is being assigned. And once we assign values to variables, they're part of our environment, and we can use them by typing the name. So now that I've defined those two values, I can find the difference in spending between the two years. I'll write in the console, diff is assigned the value, ag tech 2021 minus ag tech 2017. And press enter, and now we can see diff up in the environment. And that looks like a big number. I wonder what percent growth that represents. I can use R to calculate that. So I'll type percent growth is assigned the value diff divided by AgTech 2017 times 100. And notice that when I start typing a name, if it's a variable in the environment, R will make suggestions. I can use the arrow keys in the little menu that comes up and press enter to choose a name. So I don't have to type the whole variable name. That's helpful to prevent typos, which are an annoying sort of error to try to track down. Notice also that I use the forward slash for division, and I use the asterisk for multiplication. And when I press enter, 
we can see there was almost 246% growth in that area of AI private sector spending between 2017 and 2021 by looking at the variable percent growth in the environment area. Now, here is the interesting thing about variables in R, or at least it was interesting to me when I was learning R, coming from a programming background. R variables are all vectors, meaning an ordered collection of values. When we have a variable like agtep underscore 2017, and we see one value there, that's a vector of length one. And this is an idea that might not completely sink in until you start doing some operations on vectors. So let's do that to illustrate the concept. I can extract all of the 2017 values and all of the 2021 values from the data. I'm going to show you how I do that, but we'll talk about extracting data from tables like this in another video, so expect that this will not make sense and don't worry about it right now. I'm doing this so you can see how variables are all vectors and what that means for us calculating with variables in R. So first I am going to rename this table AI underscore invest because the name is really long. And fortunately, our studio gives me that little assist with the name. So AI invest and the arrow, which I'm going to read is, is assigned the value of, and then I'll start typing the name of the table, private underscore, and then let our studio put the rest of the name in. Okay. And now I'll write AI underscore 2017 is assigned the value. AI invest, square bracket, AI invest, dollar sign year equals 2017 comma close square bracket dollar sign total private investment by focus area inflation adjusted and AI underscore 2021 is assigned the value AI invest square bracket AI invest dollar sign year equals 2021 comma, square bracket, dollar sign, total private investment by focus area inflation adjusted. And briefly what I've done with those is filter the rows that I want to see and then select the single column that I want. So let's look at the results. So I'll type AI underscore 2017 in the console and you can see that it's a list of numbers. and if you compare with the table above, you can see it's the 2017 values only. Now there's one thing about the way that vectors are shown that might be unfamiliar. Notice that there are numbers in square brackets to the left. That's showing what index we're on. So the first value is at index 1 which may or may not be familiar. If you're coming from a programming background, you might expect the index of the first element to be zero, the offset from the start. It's not. In R, vectors begin indexing at one. And my next line is tagged eight. That first value in the next line is at index eight. And notice when I type agtech underscore 2017, our single value, it is shown the same way. There's an index to the left, one, and then the value. That's because this is also a vector, and that value is at index 1. Okay, and let's check AI underscore 2021. And that looks just like AI underscore 2017, and we can see in the environment area that they both have 26 values in them. So we have a value for each area in 2017, and a value for each area in 2021. And we can now do the same exact calculation we did before on agtech underscore 2017 and agtech underscore 2021. We can calculate a percent increase, but it will be a percent increase for all of our categories. We will get a result vector of 26% increases. Let's do that. If I use the up arrow in the console, I can go through all of my old commands. And eventually I find percent growth is assigned the value of diff divided by ag tech 2017 times 100. Let's change the names. So growth AI is assigned the value. And diff, remember, is the 2021 value minus the 2017 value. So let's just put that in parentheses. We're going to use our new vectors. So in parentheses, AI underscore 2021 minus AI underscore 2017 
divided by AI underscore 2017 times 100. And let's look at the resulting vector, growth underscore AI. Now first, this would be interesting if I wanted to know the percent growth in spending for each category, because some are really huge. We can see our agricultural increase of almost 246%, that's the first value, but we can see a couple of categories over a thousand percent. And one category that's only at two percent. But what I would like you to take away from this is that I used the same math operations that I would use on a single value, but I used them with vectors, and the calculation was done element-wise. So it carried out the operation on the elements at index 1 in each of our vectors and put the result in a vector at index 1. Then it carried out the operation on the elements at index 2 in each of our vectors and put the result in the result vector at index 2. And in fact, that's exactly what happened originally. It's just that our vectors had only one element. Eventually, we'll look at how to do manipulations like this in a table and create columns with results or summarize results in a new table. But the basis of all of that is understanding that R operates on vectors. Let's look at a couple of functions in R and how to get help. Sometimes you want to generate a vector of values, and you can use the SEQ function to do that. To learn about SEQ, in the console, type question mark SEQ and press enter. Our studio shows the documentation for seek over in the help tab on the right. We can also type help and then put the name of the function in parentheses. So help seek. And that will also display help over on the right in the help tab. And you should read through the help. Parts of it probably won't make sense, but do your best and experiment with it. Quite often there are examples at the end of the documentation. Here we have seek 0, 1, length.out equals 11, and then one that uses stats, colon, colon, r norm, and seek 1, 9, by equals 2. What we can do is pick and choose and try these, or we can click run examples above them. And we can see what each example does. So for example, seek 1, 9, by equals 2 generates odd numbers from 1 to 9. So from 1, the first argument, to 9, the second argument, in increments of 2. If you're familiar with Python, you'll recognize this as being like the range function in Python. You can see there are unnamed and named parameters. I don't know what length dot out means even after seeing the result, so I want to go back and look at the documentation now. I can click the arrow below the tab names to go back to the prior screen, which was the documentation, and I scroll up to arguments, and I see length dot out, and it says desired length of the sequence, a non-negative number, which for seek and seek dot int will be rounded up if fractional. And if we go back, we can see that seek 0, 1, length dot out equals 11 generated 11 values at even intervals between 0 and 1, inclusive. And you can see, of course, that it generates a vector result. So if you want a vector of numbers and you can specify the pattern that should be used to generate them with start, stop, and these other parameters such as length dot out, by, and there are a few others, then you can use seek. Let's generate a sequence from 1 to 100 in increments of 5 as practice. We'll write fives is assigned the value, seek, 0, comma, 100, comma, by equals 5, and press enter. And let's look at fives by typing fives and pressing enter, or, of course, we can see it up in the environment area as well. And hopefully that looks like what you would expect, 0 to 100 inclusive in increments of 5. Let's look at one other function. Suppose we want the mean average amount spent on different AI technologies in 2017. The mean is calculated by dividing the sum, or total of the values, by the number of values. We can use the sum function to sum a vector. If I write sum AI 2017 in parentheses in the console and press enter, I get the total, which is over $50 billion. 
Now, we could divide by 26 because we can see there are 26 values in the vector. But a more general solution would be better because then we could use it on data we've read in even if we don't know how much data there is. So to write that more generally, we'll need to get the length of the vector. The length function will give me the length. So to calculate the mean average, I can write sum AI 2017 divided by length AI 2017 and press enter. We could also assign that to a variable, of course, and the result is almost 2 billion on average spent on each of the various AI areas in 2017. Once we've practiced in the console and gotten to know our data a little bit, we probably want to write a script so we can save our analysis, edit it, work on it more, and maybe reuse the analysis for a future data set. We aren't really doing much with this data right now, but let's take what we've learned and write a short script that reads the data in, extracts the 2021 and 2017 spending, and calculates the vector of percentage changed, in fact always increased, between the two years for each area of spending. So in the file menu, I'll choose new file, our script. And then I'll save that in the same directory with my data. If you've programmed before, you're familiar with comments. We will want to put comments in our file, which are annotations for other programmers or data analysts, or for ourselves in the future, describing what we're doing. There's an art to writing comments, but one great description I've seen is to write why and not what. Sometimes beginning programmers will repeat the code rather than relate the code to the problem being solved. Let's begin with a comment that describes what the script is doing and where the data came from. A comment begins with a pound sign or hashtag, just like Python. You can use dashes after a pound sign to delineate parts of your file. Let's delineate our header comment that way. And we'll want to keep this to a line length of 80 characters. To my best ability, I'll follow Hadley Wickham's style guide, and I'll include a link to that in the description. There's usually a space between the pound sign and the descriptive text that follows. After our dashes, we'll write script to load a table of AI expenditures from 2017 to 2021 by category from, and I'll include the URL of the page. And then on the next line, I'll write extract expenditures for 2017 and 2021 and compute the percent increase. I'm going to paste in the citation from the data as well. So I'll just copy and paste that. And then I'm going to copy and paste the code that we wrote for the various parts of the script, loading in the table, extracting the two columns, and calculating the percent change. Now remember when I read the data in, the table was given a long name. I'm going to copy and paste that line of code and change the name to AI underscore invest because that's a much more manageable name. And above that, I'm going to put the comment, read the table from CSV. Notice too, there's a line in my code, library reader. That loads in a library that I need to use read CSV. So I'm going to put that above the line that reads the table in. Then I'm going to find the lines in which I pulled out the two vectors for expenditure in 2017 and 2021 and paste those in. Those are longer than 80 characters, so technically I should split those over two lines. I'm not going to do that right now because learning how to filter and extract columns wasn't a focus of this video. And I'll comment over that, extract expenditure for 2017 and 2021. Then we'll find our code to calculate the percent change and I'll comment over it. So calculate percent change. Growth AI is assigned the value of AI 2021 minus AI 2017 divided by AI 2017 times 100. Now we could cause the result to be printed in the console with the print statement. So print growth AI 
with a comment over it, display percent change between 2017 and 2021. Now, before we run that, this is really important. We've been doing a lot of experimenting in the console. We can see a lot of variables over in the Environment tab as a result of that experimenting, and we know that we loaded in a library, Reader. When we write a script, we want it to be able to run right when we open up our studio. If we're not careful, we could write a script that's depending on some of the variables that are already in the environment. For example, what if we forgot to create the AI 2021 and AI 2017 variables in our script? Our script would still run right now because those variables are defined, because we defined them in the console earlier in our session. But if we quit and load the script again, that will clear the environment. Or I should say, we should set up our studio so that the environment is clear when we open up. Go to Tools, Global Options, and in the General tab, uncheck Restore our data into Workspace at Startup, and make sure the pull-down for Save Workspace to our data on Exit says Never. That way you get a clean workspace each time you open up. Okay, so if we forgot part of our script, then it wouldn't work when we opened it up. To make sure it will work, we can clear the workspace by clicking on the little broom in the Environment tab that says Clear Objects from the Workspace when we mouse over it. Now select the script and press Control enter to run it and confirm it works as we expect. The other thing we can do is run the entire script using Control shift enter on a Windows machine, or run the entire script without echo, without showing each line in the script, using Control shift s on a Windows machine. These are in the code menu, source and source with echo. If you're not using the Windows operating system, you can find the key bindings for your operating system there. And you can see down in the console the lines of code that I just executed and the output, which is the vector of percent change. I hope that's a helpful introduction to basic operations using math and variables in R. To practice, I suggest you use the seek function to generate some different sequences, and then calculate the average of your sequences using sum and length. If you're feeling ambitious, you could copy the code that reads in the table and pulls columns out. Maybe you can even figure out how to find average or percent change over different years. Have fun experimenting with these concepts in R. Once you're confident with assigning to variables and performing some basic math, you're ready to move on.